Matthew Fashigal's former Wall Street Journal reporter Leslie Chung explains the history of a family begins when an individual leaves home. Young women leave home and work in factories in coastal Chinese cities, but in China, they're not the only one who migrate. Millions of Chinese are living and working away from their hometowns, and every family somehow has a story of migration in a rapidly changing China. And what do you think home means for these factory girls and also those who live and work away from their hometowns? Yeah, I think it's a very complicated idea、um, because when you say to them, "Where is your home?" they say, "My home is in the village. That's where I belong." But then you go home with them to the village, and they're finding you know all sorts of problems, and they don't feel comfortable there. And and you know when I came back from the village with Xinmin on the bus on the way back, she said to me, "You know, home is really nice, but you can only stay there a few days." You know, like. Um, that's what home means to her. It's a place kind of in her heart, but in reality, she can't really live there long term because partly because there's just no opportunity. There's nothing to do there. But then, if you look at the city, I mean, that's where she's developing and and、uh, settled. But I think for now, that doesn't really feel like home for her either.、Mm-hmm. So it's a very kind of floating, complicated notion about what home means for them. But you know, I think that's true for a lot of people in China today. I mean, in every class、yeah. of people, you meet people who are. I mean. You know, everyone is from all over, like you.、Um, yeah, everyone, yeah ev- everyone is from somewhere and living somewhere else. And if you can ask them where home is, it's a very complicated answer. It's a different answer for different. And、people. that's also probably why other people, you know, outside this group of migrants, also feel relevant about this group because they're also like somehow migrants of some sort. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when you look beyond just the numbers, you know, how much money they make or what kind of apartment they live in, you look. Beyond these material things, to to their emotional, their responses to what they're going through, and and their feelings,、um, and their sense of anxiety and unsettledness. I mean, I think these are things that speak to. I hope speak to Chinese readers more broadly because so many people are going through these kinds of changes, even if they're middle class, even if they're educated, even if they have money, they're still going through a lot of these movements and changes. Um, and this feeling of floating or an unsettledness, restlessness, I think, is very much a part of Chinese society today. You, you said a lot of times in books that、uh, history starts when one leaves home.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, so do, do, actually, the, the factory girls when they leave home and start their own history, they are kind of rewriting this、mm. Chinese history as well in a larger picture.、Mm, yeah, very much so.、Um, the reason I. I had that line in the book. Was I started to look into my own family history, and、um, my grandfather had also been a migrant of a sort, leaving his farming village to go to university in Beijing and then to go overseas for study.、Um, and so, in the course of researching this, I kind of looked into family histories, and、um, it turns out that when you look at a traditional Chinese family history, a jia pu. Um, the first person in this history is the person who's migrated from somewhere else to come to this place, wherever this place is, and then all his, all his progeny develop in this place. So it was really interesting because our view of, or at least from the outside, your view of Chinese history would be that people, it was very static. People just stayed in one place un- unless they were very wealthy or very educated or had some opportunity to move. And in fact, no migration is kind of taken for granted that this is where history begins when every family and every family had a migrant.、Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of started looking into this history and realized that migration is actually a part of history, and, and this migration that we're seeing now is only the latest,、um, the latest、uh, expression of that history.、Um, so from that came the idea that the history of a family begins when a person leaves home, and maybe all these young women leaving their homes to these these new places, they're starting a new, like you say, a new chapter or a new book of their own family history just by their moving. And、uh, what's your What was your preconception about the factory girls before you actually did the interview, and how did your understanding kind of evolved? Well, I guess initially I was I was afraid that their lives would be very monotonous, possibly very depressing,、yeah. and that there would be nothing for me to write about, or it'd be a very boring or depressing story. <laughs> But what I found was that it was actually very enjoyable to spend time with the workers because they had a lot of ideas and a lot of fun, you know, jokes, and you know, they were very curious and asked a lot of unpredictable, <laughs> yeah, asked a lot of questions, and I felt like their life. 
they had a very rich culture, you know, and it's not a kind of culture like traditional high culture and, and novels and art and things, but they had a culture of the self-help books that they read and the mobile phone culture and the ringtones, you know, and, and learning English and the English textbooks. And so they had a very rich kind of alternate culture um, to to the traditional one. And I found it really interesting to learn this culture and... and uh, and to get to know it and to write about it. And in your book, you mentioned a lot of times that the easiest way, and uh, in Dongguan, it's very easy to lose touch with your friends, lose someone else. So, mm -hmm. so what do you think of the relations or interpersonal relations in in the, this factory town? One part of my reporting was in the Yuyan Shoe Factory, and there are twelve girls who live in one twelve girls or twelve guys who live in one room, um, and they work together on the factory floor. And I thought that. That meant that these twelve girls would be really tight. They would be friends and know each other's secrets and be like a just you know, and it wasn't like that at all. And often you know, one girl might not know really know the name of the girl who slept in the bed next to her, or someone would leave and they wouldn't know what happened to her, or they might tell me she left and in fact she was still there. You know, so the even the relations between the people in the room were very uh, distant. You know, and I think this was partly just because. In a city full of strangers, you kind of have to protect yourself, you know. And and they didn't want to give them give out their emotions so quickly, and then have someone just leave, you know, and then be really d disappointed and sad. Um, so what I found was that most of these young women might have one good friend, maybe someone who they first initially met in their first factory, um, and then they would keep keep in touch with that person. And maybe that person now worked in another factory far away. And then on the weekends or on the days off, they would try to meet up um, and spend time together. And that was like their good friend, like almost like their sister. Um, but then everyone else, they would just kind of keep their distance. And I, I think many of the factory girls do not really you know, understand the products they're making. And it seems like an abstract relation mm. between the products they're making and the factory girls. Mm. And what do you think of it? Yeah, I was really interested in this because, especially in the foreign media, they always focus on this. You know, like this is the worker who makes the iPhone, and but she can't afford to buy her own iPhone, and that seems to be a symbol of how oppressive the factories are. And the reality is, it's not that they don't know; it's that they don't care. You know, because for them, the factory is just a tool for them. The factory is a tool, a vehicle for them to earn more money or to learn some skills. Or to train themselves and then to jump to something else, either jump higher within the factory or jump to a better factory somewhere else. This relation of workers to the products probably comes from Marx originally, this idea that workers should have a really meaningful relationship with their products. And the Industrial Revolution meant that workers are now completely alienated from the products they make. And in the end, who cares? You know, they don't. They don't care about their products because they care about other things like their lives, um, and I think that's what really matters to them. And as the urbanization of China goes on, how do you think China can absorb such kind of large influx of rural population into the cities? Um, well, I think it's happening every day, and um, you know we see these cities um, expanding and a lot of new housing, and a lot of that is eventually for workers and people who do well and decide to settle down in the city. Uh, in a place like Dongguan, you see huge, huge uh, housing developments that have developed, and most of the people who live there are are migrants who've done well because the the native population of Dongguan is is uh, you know under two million, and the migrant population is eight million. So if you see all these high rises going up, it's because of the migrants. You know, so I mean, I think the the cities are doing the things they need to do to to you know provide housing and whatever. I mean, it's not really the cities; it's kind of just the businesses. That's just the business opportunity for companies to provide housing for the workers to sell to sell these apartments.